Hey, it's 2016. I took a few weeks off to recharge my batteries, but we're back. And let's start things off with a really simple question, something that's really easy to answer. Is there a God? Jonathan Juarez asked, you seem like a really smart guy, Joe, so I'm interested in what religious beliefs you have, and if so, why? Okay, all right, <clears throat> let's do this. First off, I really appreciate you thinking that I'm smart. But if I do a video on religion, it's pretty much guaranteed that a lot of people will disagree with you by the end of it. There's a reason why they say never discuss politics or religion at the dinner table. But I pissed off a lot of people with my gun control videos, so hey, why not? Flame on! We're gonna talk about God! There's two types of questions that I get asked on here. One is the kind that has an absolute answer. You can just do a Google search and find all the facts yourself. The other type doesn't really have answers out there to be found, so the only thing that I can search is myself. The first one is much easier. Thanks, Jonathan. So religion is a very personal thing, and the only way that I feel like I can answer this is to just tell you the journey that I've been on. So here it goes. I grew up in a very religious family. There were actually a lot of heads of churches in my extended family. We had family reunions every year on Father's Day at this old Indian fort called Fort Belknap, and it consisted of two parts. There was a church service on Sunday mornings, but the night before, on Saturday night, we would all gather and sing hymns as the sun went down. And this was actually my favorite part. As a child, all I knew was that there was a room full of people who all loved each other, they were hugging each other, they hadn't seen each other in a whole year, and they probably weren't gonna see each other again for another year. We sang beautiful old time religion songs that had been handed down for generations. Actually, a lot of them showed up in the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Um, which made watching that movie kind of overwhelming as all those memories flooded back in. Memories of those songs being sung by a chorus of people who loved me while I played frisbee with my cousins out in a field flecked with hundreds of fireflies. <sighs> I like those songs. There was absolutely no reason for my 10-year-old self to doubt that there was a God, that he loved me, and that he gave his son's life so that everything I ever do would be forgiven. And I remember the first time I ever heard somebody say that they were an atheist. I was at school and some kid said that he was an atheist. And I remember one of the other kids asked, so what do you think happens when you die? And he was like, you die and they bury you. And I remember being horrified by that thought. And I remember thinking like, how could you get out of bed if you actually thought that? But the older I got, the more complex the issue of religion became to me. I saw people from church acting very unchristian, you know, wearing a cross necklace and then judging other people and being rude. I worked in restaurants where I saw firsthand that the church crowd are the worst tippers in the whole world. And a lot of just the little idiosyncrasies of the dogma just didn't add up for me anymore. Like if God is all powerful and all knowing, then why does he need my help and my money? Why did God have to kill his son in order to forgive my sins? Why couldn't he just forgive me? For that matter, why did he make sin in the first place? If God is all love, then why would he send me to hell for eternity because I didn't honor my father and mother correctly? For that matter, why did he make hell in the first place? It just became harder and harder for me to just believe. And then somewhere in my early 20s, I began to seriously consider the possibility that maybe God doesn't exist. I mean, could it be possible that all religion is just a way for us to deal with the fact that we are mortal, that we have an end date? Is it, is it just our way of dealing with the seemingly pointless nature of it all? I didn't want that to be true. It didn't feel true. Of course, you know, speaking in public makes me feel like I'm in mortal danger when I'm actually in no danger whatsoever. Feelings can't be trusted. Or is the idea of God such an enduring belief because, much like love, it's something that's very real but can't be measured? So I suppose I've been what one might call a seeker, and that term is viewed in equal parts derision and pride depending on a person's religious stance, but I like that term better than agnostic because the term agnostic seems to imply that you don't really care. And I do care. A lot enough to be constantly searching for an answer. But the paradox about being a seeker is that as I'm searching for an answer, I also think that the answer can't be known, which makes me skeptical of anybody who thinks that they do know the answer. Even if somebody says that the answer is that there's no God, because I don't think that's something that you can know. Because to me, it's not really about God. It's about, you know, just reality. I mean, what is this thing? We live in this sensory space around our bodies, and it all makes sense to us. We think we've got a good, beat on things. But when you look to the edges of our collective knowledge, you start to see that this whole thing just 
falls apart. We now think that 94% of our universe is made up of dark energy and dark matter, two things that we have absolutely no proof of outside of indirect observation and math equations. We're finding out that the fundamental particles that make up all matter can pop in and out of existence and be in multiple places at once and only exist in probability states. Probability states that can be affected by observation and actions in the future that haven't even taken place yet. We still aren't 100% sure how gravity works. So for anyone to consider all of that and say that they think they know the answer about God because of what they can see around them, to me, that's just so nearsighted. So you can't trust your feelings and you can't trust your observations. So what can you trust? Nothing. Nothing. Which is exactly what you're supposed to focus on when you meditate. Meditation has been used for millennia as a way to transcend the physical space and enter a higher enlightened consciousness. Every major religion has some form of meditation practice as part of their religion, especially if you consider prayer to be a type of meditation, which many people do. There are amazing stories of people who have had an enlightenment experience while in this state, and in these experiences they come back with knowledge they didn't have before and an absolute certainty that they were able to connect with a higher consciousness. I'll link to one in the comments. It's from Sean Webb of the I Am Spirituality podcast, and he, he talks about the enlightenment experience that he had, and it is absolutely bananas. I mean, you, you've got to watch it. Just go check it out. So if people are having this experience, there's a couple of different uh, possible explanations. One might be a surge in DMT. DMT, or trimethyltryptamine, is an endogenous chemical, which means that it's something that our body produces internally. And it also just happens to be one of the most powerful hallucinogenics in the world. People who take doses of DMT have out-of-body experiences where they feel like they've transcended this level of reality and they communicate with otherworldly beings and connect to some shared higher consciousness, which are very similar to near-death experiences. In fact, a lot of the people who study it call it the spirit molecule for that reason. But could it be that simple? Is it just our bodies tripping on our own self-made acid? The thing is, people's experiences on DMT are strikingly similar. It's not just that they're having these experiences, it's that they're all having the same experiences. Geometric patterns, feelings of floating, connecting to an unseen entity. Could it be that they're all connecting to the same source? Something outside themselves? And if so, how does that work? Well, nobody knows. But there are some theories. One is called ORC-OR, or Orchestrated Objective Reduction. And it gets pretty intricate. In fact, I'm just going to read you a line from their Wikipedia page. The qubits are based on oscillating dipoles forming superposed resonance rings and helical pathways throughout microtubule lattices. Yeah. What that guy said. It basically argues that there are microstructures inside the neurons of our brains that allow us to interact on a quantum level with an outside consciousness. Now, this is hotly disputed, okay? But it's not entirely disproven. But let's just go with it for a second and assume that you can connect to an outside consciousness. Where did that come from? I did a video previously about quantum entanglement and how subatomic particles can be connected to other subatomic particles and communicate instantaneously across infinite distances. And since how all matter was created in the Big Bang and spread out from there, that means that connected particles could be interacting with each other all the way across the universe. And how Richard Feynman once theorized that every electron in the universe could be the same electron. Could these infinitely connected subatomic particles communicating instantaneously across all of space and time create some kind of universal superconsciousness? Can non-conscious matter connect in such a way to create a consciousness? Well, the fact that you're watching this means that it can. Your brain is made up of a hundred billion neurons, none of which by themselves can hold a memory or make a thought or do anything like that, but they connect in such a way that through chemical and electrical signals, they create a consciousness. And far from being some kind of miracle, this could be a fundamental property of reality itself. This field of study is something that some scientists are calling emergence theory. Emergence is a process whereby larger entities' patterns and regularities arise through interactions among smaller or simpler entities that themselves do not exhibit such properties. An ant, for example, has a tiny little brain. It just has some encoded instructions in this little cluster of neurons that it follows and has no idea that it is working toward a bigger goal throughout this entire colony of creating entire cities underground. Each cell in your body has tiny little proteins and subcellular mechanisms that are just going about their business, doing their thing. They have no idea that they are serving the larger purpose of keeping the cell alive. And the cell just does its thing and goes about its business, and it has no idea that it's serving the larger purpose of keeping us alive. And we just go about our business, and we just do our things, and we have no idea. Does our existence serve a higher purpose that we have no way of seeing ourselves? Emergence says it could. 
Astrophysics says that the atoms in our bodies are the same as the atoms scattered all throughout the universe. We are a part of that infinity. And quantum physics says that all those atoms have some atomic particles that communicate instantaneously with each other. All of these things point to some very interesting possibilities. And I don't think that some kind of universal superconsciousness or God is really out of the question. And for now, that's as far as I'm gonna go. I'm sure this won't stir up any comments or anything. Now, none of this really spoke to organized religion. Um, I think that's really more of a societal and psychological thing. And so I didn't really get into that. I just personally think that um, religions have their good and bad. A lot of really good things have been done in the name of religion. And yeah, a lot of really terrible things have been done in the name of religion. But if it wasn't religion, I think it would have been something else. People are looking for a reason to do the things, a justification to do the things that they want to do in their own mind. Whatever it is you believe, if we do serve a higher consciousness, I think the only way we can adequately do so is by connecting and bringing each other together and not by dividing each other and warring and killing each other. So if I had a cause that I really wanted to promote with this channel, it would be to get people to break out of fundamentalist and tribal thinking and this idea that something is better based on the fact that it's yours. I honestly believe that if there's some kind of judgment at the end of our lives, either in a spiritual sense or you know, by history, it's only gonna come down to one thing. Did you connect people and bring people together with love and understanding, or did you divide people and push people apart with hatred and fear? Personally, I choose to do the former, and I hope you join me. Thank you all for watching and to Jonathan for a <laughs> great question. If you've got a question you'd like answered, you can ask it down in the comments below or hit me up at Joe Scott Writer on Twitter and we can do this together. If you like what I had to say here, give me a thumbs up, share it on social media, spread the word about this channel. We're growing, things are going well and I really appreciate your help with that. So of course, if you liked what I had to say, uh, please hit subscribe. I come back every Monday with more stuff just like this. Um, I hope you guys go out there and have a great eye-opening week and I'll see you back here next Monday. Take care, love you guys. God is in coffee.